friends, we are back live with another edition of the Cheapy Productions Pro Wrestling Podcast. My name is Jack Kilby, Executive Vice President of Great North Wrestling, and I'm really, really excited to have a special guest on the show today. A man who, well, there you go, and very, very self-deprecating, as we'll see, but a man who was the, the proprietor of Tri-State Wrestling Alliance from about 89 to 91, but without whom and his efforts, there, there would really be no ECW Extreme Championship Wrestling and a few other correlations that we'll get into. I am talking, of course, of Mr. Joel Goodhart. Joel, thanks so much for coming on today, sir. Hey, Jack, great to be here and enough with the mister. <laughs> I guess I guess a good place to start, uh, as yeah. any, is to ask about what what inspired you to become involved in the business as a promoter. Well, I'll tell you now. There's a little. Everything's got a story. Um, I got introduced. I, I'm in the financial services business, and I worked back then with a lot of accountants. And one of the accountants called me up and I said, "There's somebody I need you to meet." Uh, they're interested in getting some life insurance, whatever it was. So I went out to see this couple, and it was Paul and Carmela, Pan- well, actually Carmela and Paul Panfill. And Carmela and I hit it off, and Paul and I hit it off. And when I, my meeting was over, Paul happened to say to me, by the way, if you ever need tickets for anything, Broadway shows, concerts, sporting events, I do the tickets on the side. And... So be it. So I made a little note of that. About a week or so later, I called Paul for something. And Paul says to me, by the way, you want to go to the wrestling matches this Saturday night? And I said, yeah, sure. Now, at that, that, at that time, I was separated. I said, sure, I'll go to the matches. Why not? He says, do you like wrestling? I said, I went to wrestling when I was a kid. My father used to take me to the matches. I used to go to the Philadelphia Arena. I saw Bruno San Martino Spiros Arion, who I loved. He was my guy. And, yeah, we'll go to the matches. Well, sure enough, Paul takes me to the matches first row. Okay. And I I suddenly realized this guy's connected. He got front row seats. And that was when the NWA was coming into Philadelphia. And if you like wrestling, NWA wrestling was was phenomenal. You see the Rock and Roll Express, Midnight Express, I can go on and on. Mm -hmm. After two or three matches, after two or three shows that Paul took me to, there was a guy walking around the ring wearing a suit. And I'm one of these guys, I'm, I'll be pro. So I walked up to the guy and said, I don't know who you are, but you look like you're somebody I should know. And he says, yeah, my name is Elliot Murnick, who has since passed away. And I'm the promoter for the show here for Jim Crockett Promotions in Philadelphia. I said, well, we need to talk. And I don't know why I said that. And he says, well, I'll tell you what, come back to the Marriott afterwards. We'll sit down and we'll have a drink. Okay, well, I don't drink, but I said, sure, we'll go. I'll go back. I go back to the Marriott. There's 300 people at the Marriott. They're all looking for the wrestlers. Obviously, these are the guys that go to the matches and the ladies that go to the matches all the time and know where this is going on. And sure enough, then Lex Luger walks in the door, Rock and Roll Express, and they're all running after them. I go sit down with the guy with the suit, and I talk to Elliot Murnick. One thing leads to the other, and you ask me how I got into all this stuff. He says to me, after two or three months of shows, we get together after each show. He says to me, I have a question for you. I said, okay. You ever been interested in getting involved in the wrestling business? And I said, no, never thought of it. He says, well, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I live in North, meaning him, I live in North Carolina. And I have to come up to Philadelphia to help promote these shows. It's a hell of a hole. And I I take my boat. He takes his boat from North Carolina to Philly. I don't know how long that takes. And he says to me, I'd like to have some eyes and ears in Philadelphia. That was his term to me. I said, you got him. Unfortunately, I wear glasses, but I can hear it. Uh, Okay. Well, we hit it off. And that one thing led to the other. He actually, later on down the line, asked me to promote a show for him. So we did one of the Crockett shows in Philly up here on a Wednesday night. Okay, and I had to go find a building because it wasn't the typical Saturday night. I found the building, found this, and I promoted a show for him. 
And then one thing led to the but, other. Yeah. I got to meet Gary Juster through him, and Juster was the promoter down in Baltimore. And then one thing led to the other. All of a sudden, I found myself in the back meeting the guys. The guys got to know me. And I must have been with you, too. You get the bug. <laughs> okay? And once you get the bug, one thing led to the other. And so I promoted my own shows. I worked with Carmella, and we promoted shows. Carmella at some point decided that she wanted to, to do the full-time gig with her daughter, which was a smart move on her part. And so I started doing my own thing, and one thing led to the other. But the first show, I'll show you how far back this goes. The first show that Carmel and I promoted was in a high school gym. Our booker was Dominic Danucci, who she was, well, Carmel was very close with. And our main event was Dominic Danucci against the mighty Igor. Oh, wow. Okay. Now, trust me when I tell you, both those guys were toward the end, actually at the end of their career. And it certainly wasn't what he, Mighty Igor didn't look like Ivan Plisky, but everybody who was, who knew wrestling knew who Mighty Igor was. And that was in our main event. But on that card, we had some, some of Dominic Danucci's students, one of which was a guy by the name of Trevor Martin, Trey Martin, Shane Douglas. Shane Douglas. Mm -hmm. So Shane was on my first show. Wow. And I see Shane every once in a while, one of these icons and what have you. And we talk about those good old days. But he was on my first card. Cactus mm -hmm. Jack wasn't. Cactus was later on. But, uh, yeah, so, I mean, that that got the bug. That got me started. Mm -hmm. What uh, – so from there, you you established uh, TWA. And I, and I was interested uh, right off the hop with how you put the matches together. Like, what was your – philosophy behind that in addition to the obvious that you know you you offered loaded shows you seem to be uh it seemed to be like a, a something for for everybody on uh, one of your cards could you expand on that just a little bit yeah i'll tell you i'll, I'll go i'll answer your question you jumped a little ahead because the twa started three or four shows into my career okay now when i created the twa one of my I'll call one of the designs that I had was I wanted to take the best of Memphis and keep in mind, we did Memphis. We used to do our trips, the squared circle fan club. We did trips to Memphis. We got very tight with Jerry Lawler again through Carmella, who was really close with Jerry. Um, but I wanted to get the best of Memphis, the best of world class, the best of Georgia, the best of Florida. So even though I'm getting some credit for, the birth of the Attitude Era. Yes, you know what? I stole everything. I didn't create anything other than I created the mix. Okay? And what I decided was there were a couple of rules of thumb that I had in my wrestling when I did wrestling shows. One was that at any point in the show, you would have a front row seat. So I liked when the wrestlers went outside the ring. And sometimes they would battle in the building. Falls County were in the building. Mm -hmm. And so if you had a Falls County were in the building, just about if you got all over the place, everybody had a front row seat at some point. All right. The second thing that I tried to do, and I didn't do it on every show, was I had a philosophy that your first match was a main event match. Because I hated when people showed up 10 minutes into a show. I hated that with a passion. So I wanted the word to get out. You better get to the show one time because the first match, one of my first matches one time was Eddie Gilbert against Cactus, Cactus Jack. That was a man, that's a main event match. And that was number one. Then you take the match down and then you build up to the main event. But once the word got out that my show started on time, number one, number two, that the first match was going to be a main event type match. And it wasn't ever, we had matches. We had a battle royal fun time first match. So that was another second philosophy of mine. And the third was, you're not going to come to the show and notice, know what's going to happen. You know, every time you have a main event match, you always think, okay, this one's going to be. Well, we always wanted to have a surprise. Okay. And we had a lot of surprises. So I think that was my, the attitude piece of this. Um, and I wanted to make sure that if you brought your camera, you ran out of film. Now, today you got phones and 
think about we, what we did. We had no internet. We ha- if you wanted to get your pictures ta- taken, you had to go to the CVS and take a week to get the pictures back. Mm-hmm. Okay, now, so uh, it's amazing what we were able to accomplish with the tools that we had. I mean, the radio was my television. Okay, mm-hmm. and again, for those people who are in my area here, we had a lot of listeners to the radio show. In fact, I, I can give you numbers, but if everybody who listened to the radio show would come to the show, I would have sold out the spectrum here against the WWF. Mm-hmm. I had 29,000 listeners to my show. Wow. Okay, they what, have. What was that called again? Wrestling Radio? Wrestling Radio. R A. Yeah, R A S S L I N. It was funny. I never thought that we did wrestling, we did wrestling. Okay. And I loved the the wrestlers took on the attitude. They knew what I wanted. Okay. Mm-hmm. They knew I I wanted violence. I wanted people to sit back and go, whoa. And to be honest, and I know this is, you know, this is somewhat we're talking 30 years after the fact. When people came to my show at the end of the show or during the show, they would say to whoever they came with, oh my God. This is real. Okay. Mm -hmm. I wanted that. I overpaid. Everybody knows I overpaid, but every one of the guys knew put out or you're not going to be used again. Okay. And I, man, one time I did a three, a Friday, Saturday, Sunday. The main event was Wahoo McDaniel against Manny Fernandez. And if I'm telling you they killed each other on Friday night, killed each other on Saturday night, killed each other on Sunday night. How they did it, I don't know. Mm-hmm. And I, to this day, I see Manny every once in a while. When we talk about the matches, I don't know how they did what they did. Three nights in a row. I don't get it. And that, to me, even to this day, I sit back and go, that was real. Mm-hmm. They killed, they beat the living hell out of each other. But they knew that's what I wanted. And the fans get their fans get their money's worth. wanted Wanted to also ask you about uh, you know you had such a lo- loyal uh, fan base, and part and parcel of that was the radio show that you mentioned. But also, my first exposure to TWA, which I found uh, you know just captivating, w- was in the magazines. Yeah, seemed to get a lot of coverage in the magazines. Lots of. Uh, lots of attention to the Eddie Gilbert Cactus Jack program. How vital were the magazines and that coverage to the success of your organization? Well, I'll tell you, it was part. It, it was part of it, no question. In fact, it was the radio show. It was the fan club. It was the matches. It was the wrestling magazines for sure. I was very fortunate being based in Philly. Okay, Bill Lapter was local. George Napolitano was local. I'm 90 miles away from New York where all the magazines were, so Bob Smith would come down. And what I basically said to them is, here's the deal. You can shoot pictures all you want. Just make sure you give TWA the credit. I don't want pictures showing up that you're taking my matches and there's no courtesy of or whatever. And I didn't need courtesy of Joel Goodhart. I didn't need the name. Tri-State Wrestling Alliance. Well, they bought into what we were doing. They saw that I was bringing in wrestlers that they couldn't get to see. So, I mean, I talk about the Sheik. He came in from Detroit. I had Curry Von Erich and Kevin Von Erich. Of course, they came from Texas. They either had to go to Texas to see these guys, or I was bringing them to Philly. Yes. Um, my One of the first matches that Carmel and I promoted, the main event was Bruiser Brody against Abdul the Butcher. Wow. Think, about, think about that one. And again, I got to know Abby. We had I had Abdul on many shows for sure. And uh, you go through the list: the Eddie Gilbert Cactus Jack. I mean, Cactus lived in New York. Bam Bam Bigo lived in North Jersey. So okay, so I got some of the local guys that would, would drive. It saved me a fortune. If I could have Bam Bam Bigo and Cactus Jack on every card, I didn't have any transportation. I paid some tolls. Um, one of the things that I did is by bringing in the talent to Philly, the magazines just came to get the, I just wanted the credit. So Jerry Lawler would come up to every show. Austin Idol would come up from, you know, down South. I had Adrian Street. I had Jimmy Valiant. I mean, I can go down the list. They came to my shows. I had Paul Orndorff and Tully Blanchard on the same, same show. 
I'm telling you, I got the, the when I had honky tonk, when I had Jerry, these pick, they were getting pictures of guys that they could travel 90 miles and keep it local. Um, and that really worked in my favor. And yes, what it did is it established credibility. I'll go mm -hmm. one better. When we created the TWA, I, I had cards at Temple University. And then I had a belt made up for the, the, the new TWA champion. Well, once I brought the belt to the ring, and it's on video, you can see it on YouTube, and I, I gave out the belt and showed the belt. As I walked out of the ring, Bill Lampter comes up to me and says, I want you to know that we're going to recognize the TWA belt. Oh, what kind of credibility is that? Instant. Okay, so the magazines that Bill Lampter was representing, he says to me as I'm walking out of the ring, I didn't get down onto the floor. We're going to recognize the TWA belt. Well, that doesn't happen if Bill Lapter's not there. So, mm -hmm. I mean, to this day, he helped establish the credibility of TWA by just that simple little saying. So, mm -hmm. yes, it was very helpful that the magazines were there. But, we, you know, I had a two-way street. I helped them, and they, quite frankly, helped me. Mm -hmm. I, I, I remember uh, George Napolitano's uh, photography, and uh, th that immediately, you know, given the talent that you had, Plus the uh, the the photographs, it, it really jumped out that TWA was uh, a name and something to be um, yep. something to be considered. Yeah, they gave you credibility for sure, no question. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, how did you uh, go about uh, scouting and uh, booking these these talents? And we'll talk about the more uh, local guys in a minute. Yeah, but how how did you land on? some of the uh the huge uh stars that that you you brought in was there a process there or did you go according to what you were interested in seeing no it was a combination of that i mean first of all i will tell you once the word got out getting a hold of those guys was very easy the one thing you learn about the wrestling community is everybody knows everybody so if you work with one guy and you say by the way they got a phone number now, the one thing that I did, and I did get a good reputation, is I did not give out phone numbers. If you gave me a phone number, I, that's the phone number. I didn't use it to do it. That was the end of it. And there was actually a story in the Philadelphia Daily News, uh, and I won't get into this one because this could be a whole show into itself. But Rick Flair one time, and again, I knew Rick, and Rick had my number and I had his. Rick called me up one time. And he says, by the way, we're going to be doing a show in Philly called Halloween Havoc. And um, we need to get, we'd like to get Bruno San Martino as the referee in this match. Because Bruno's obviously very popular in Philly. And he said, do you mind if I, if you give me Bruno's number? And I said, I don't give out a phone number. I'll call Bruno. And if you want, I'll get, you on, get him on the phone now. We can have a three-way call. And he said, could you do that? So I called Bruno. And there I am sitting there with Bruno on one line and Ric Flair on the other. Rick gets the deal done for Bruno to be the referee. So Halloween Havoc, if you ever watched that from 1989, yeah. and the, the main event, I helped create the main event. Okay. But the kicker there was I didn't give Flair Bruno's number. And the word got out that I'm, I'm not going to play games with phone. Numbers. I'm a professional. Okay. So getting back to your question, once the word got out that we're doing shows in Philly and the guy who's the moron who's in the promoting suit is the one who's paying and overpaying, guess what? Getting them was not hard, okay? Mm -hmm. And one, again, Bill After and George Napolitano, I know said to some guys, you ought to be down there, okay? I know how, how this thing worked. Then when I was working with Jerry Lawler, Lawler was able to get some names and numbers for me. Um, then it was amazing. I just, it started to snowball. It snowballed so much that, quite frankly, the mark in me was, I took over. Okay. And I tell this story all the time that one of the matches I had was Adrian Street against Jimmy Valiant. Now, the, only the hardcores would want to see that match. By the time I had the match in Philly, those guys were done. I mean, they did their they did their thing, but I was ecstatic as a promoter. I got Adrian Street north of the Mason Dixon line. Jimmy Valiant 
loved to work for me. In fact, I'm in his book. He calls me Joel instead. He calls me Joe instead of Joel, but I'm in the book by good heart, by the last name. Um, and to this day, I see him and I, and we, and we kid each other all the time because he, he knows that he put Joe instead of Joel in there. But mm-hmm. the word got out. And I'm telling you, I had a ball. I had Chris Adams. I had Kevin. I mean, I could go down this list. One, Al Perez was one of the guys I love working with. He was great for my every show. With it, Bill and Ben Bigelow's another one. He got the word out. So to, to answer your question, it was it took time to start. Was Dominic Danucci? Dominic Danucci was our first booker for that first show. But little by little, when when Carmel and I and Paul opened up the Square Circle, we had a store, and. The the, main, the, uh, the wrestlers that we had come in to do the signatures for the autographs was Bruno San Martino and Dominic Danucci. Okay? And I, it wasn't me that got him. It was Carmelo that got him. Okay? Mm-hmm. Carmelo knew them from years before. We just took it to the next level. And like I said, it was the word got out. And then it was the fan in me. I would, I look, I knew Carmen. I looked at, I know all the, I knew George Sampolitano. I knew Bo Aptor. You look all you have to do is say, by the way, I'd love to get, and it's amazing how you get to those people. So mm-hmm. I will tell you, it's, it's word of mouth. Um, and it was also the checkbook. These guys, it's amazing how these guys wanted to work for me because they knew they were going to get paid. Okay. And I'm look, I, here it is 30 years later. Could I have done it cheaper? Yeah. And guess what? I wouldn't be talking to you about it 30 years later. Mm-hmm. You get what you pay for. Not only the checkbook, but the fact that you had a reputation, unlike some of your predecessors, that your checks would not bounce. Yeah. Oh, that I'll tell you. I'll go, I'll go one better. I only had only one time did a check bounce on me. Okay, and it was Doctor Death, Steve Williams, of all people. Oh boy. <laughs> okay, and it wound up my check. Don't ask. The check was short by three dollars. Okay. And the bank bounced, and I was upset with the bank, so, but they called me. And sure enough, they, ex- they expressed, so, and they actually went to call Steve Williams to tell them that it wasn't my fault, that the money, and they could never get a hold of him. Okay. But that was the only check I ever wrote, to, and I, I'm admitting to it because, the, you know, there's no reason to lie. It's the only check I ever wrote to bounce. And then a lot of the guys would ask for cash in, in lieu of checks. And that was not for me. I gave them the check. If they signed the back of a check, I, gave, I would cash it for them. But I wasn't paying people cash. Okay? But these guys knew the check was good. All right? And if I paid them by check and I didn't give them any cash, they still had money in their pocket. Okay? The hotels were paid for. I didn't put them in, I didn't put them in flea bag hotels. If they were staying at a hotel, generally speaking, it was at the at the Marriott here in Philly. And I liked the Marriott because that's where the NWA stayed. That's where the WWF stayed. Well, if it's good enough for them, it's good enough for me. And mm-hmm. I wasn't willing to put – I wanted them to be in a room that I would want to stay in if they were paying a room for me. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. the word the word got out. The word got out. And, you know, when I went under, um, that word – I know there were a lot of people that were disappointed – but I'll tell you, when you look back to the old videos that we have that are on YouTube and whatever, you see some people in the crowd that became wrestlers. Okay, you see people that look recognizable. You see, it's amazing. And I, I see some people in these old videos, the, the hat guy from the ECW. I mean, and Vladimir was at my shows. I mean, everybody, if you were a wrestling fan, you went, Dr. Lano came in from California to take photographs at my shows. I Mike mean, Leno. Yeah, Mike Leno. So it's just, mm-hmm. it's unbelievable. And mm-hmm. I'll tell you, it, it, you know, you, I, you think back, you try to think back what made it work. And the answer is it all made it work. It's mm-hmm. all a little bit of this, a little bit of that. Did I overdo it? Sure I did. I, I used to have a card with four main events. You only need one. Mm-hmm. Most promoters mm-hmm. don't even have one. Mm-hmm. And what worked best for me, and I will say this up to you up front, with all the names I brought in, what made all my shows work weren't the names. The names were fine, and they were there. Give me Larry Winters, DC Drake, Tony Stetson, Johnny Hotbody, Bay Ragney, Jimmy Gennetti, Glenn Osborne. I can, and I'm missing a lot of them. 
they're the ones that made it work. There's no, yeah. question, no question at all. It was the local talent that made those shows work. Yeah, I'm, I'm, we're, we're, we're definitely going to uh, get into those uh, originals. Um, but in terms for, for some of the younger fans that aren't aware, and, and I've got a list of some, some pretty huge uh, matches that, that stand out. I was, I was going to ask you about a couple of them briefly, how they came together and we probably won't get through the full list, but one of the most uh, well remembered and still talked about by uh, fans of a certain vintage to this day is the battle of the Bam Bams. Terry Gordy against uh, Bigelow. Yep. How did that one uh, come together? I wanted a There was a Battle of the Bam Bams that took place somewhere. And one of the magazines had a Battle of the Bam Bams. Well, one of the things that I tried to do was have Bam Bam Bigelow on every show I could book him. Because he was. I didn't have to worry about transportation. All right? And I happened to say to him, you mind if we put together a Battle of the Bam Bams? Well, I didn't get to Gordy without Bigelow. Bigelow got a hold of him. I told Terry what we're trying to do here in Philadelphia. Love to have you. And sure enough, I had a battle of the Bam Bams. And it was it was weird. The First of all, Bam Bam was the kind of guy that I talked to all the time. It was local, and he was, he was really into what we were doing. And what I did with a couple of these people, Bam Bam, et cetera, between Bam Bam, Bigelow, Cactus Jack, I would say to these guys, you're on every card I have. I'll let you know the dates. If you can make it, you're on it. We'll figure out something. And sure enough, they knew they were on every show. Okay? That they could bet. Now, of course, Bam Bam would go to Japan, and I would miss him sometime. And he could be on every card. And sometimes he was booked somewhere else. And I was never one who would say, I'll steal you. I, that's, that wasn't for me. In fact, there's one story again, just a side note. Manny Fernandez one time called me up for one of my big shots. I had him going against Abdul the Butcher. And he calls me up and he says, and I don't recall who the promoter was, somebody's having a show in the afternoon. Do you mind if I work that show? And I said, I don't mind it, but get on the first or second match because I need you to drive down to be at my show. Well, sure enough, he gets he's the last. He was in the main event, okay? So it was another payday. He comes down to my show. He got dressed in the car. Okay. <laughs> Whoever was driving, he went in the back seat, got dressed in his gear. When we when you watch the match, he wasn't on time for the match. So I had Abdullah go out, and then Cactus would Cactus Jack went out after being on the card, beat got his ass kicked by Abdullah, and then Manny runs into the ring in the middle of the match. Okay, and Manny kept his word. He said he'd be there, and he was there. And he, but he wasn't. I wouldn't let him miss a second payday because of my show. It's just not what I was all about. So mm -hmm. yes, that the Battle of Bam Bams was Bam. Actually, Bam Bam Bigelow put, helped me get Terry Gordy. What about uh, you? Touched on this earlier, but uh, still quite remarkable given the time frame. Abdullah the Butcher again versus the original Sheik. <laughs> was you you had to be there now the original sheik for those who didn't know that's how i got to sabu mm -hmm. okay the original sheik could not or would not fly now at one point in his career he was banned on every airline in the united states okay because the one thing you learned about sheik was he lived the part okay and it was similar to Flair, just on a different situation, but he lived the part. Well, I had Abdullah. Like I said, I'd worked with Abby. In fact, I used to eat at Abdullah's restaurant in Atlanta. He had, oh, his ribs were phenomenal. His ribs were phenomenal. Anyway, I had Abby, and one time I happened to say to Abdullah, I'd love to get to the Sheik. Well, the next thing I know, I got a phone call. Okay? Now, this sounds, the Sheik called me. Wow. I didn't call Sheik. She called me. And I said to Sheik, I'm, look, I'm doing a match. I'd love to have you and Abdullah. I've seen the Japanese tapes. I've seen everything. Um, and he says, okay. And we talked numbers. And he says, I'll be there. Okay. And I said, well, let me tell me what airline. He's not. Nah, I'm going to, we're going to drive in. Okay. You'll, you'll reimburse me for my gas. I said, no problem. So the next thing I know, he, he gets driven in. 
by his driver who was Sabu. And I put Sabu in one of the main, not in the main event, but one of the battle royals that we had. So I think in Sabu, I should tell you this right now, he was, I was one of the first promoters that worked him. Now, I never had Sabu on my billboard, and Sabu was never a main event kind of match, but Sabu got started on my show. Now, he had worked in Detroit in that area, but was on, coming on East. But, yeah, so I got the Sheik, and he came in, and he did the, he did the match. And I just said to Abdullah, I need this match to be one people will remember. Now, you knew it wasn't going to be because it was going to be a wrestling match. They came, it was, they came out onto the floor, and they went all over the place. And people were scared. When people came to my show, a lot of the, they were scared because these wrestlers, they didn't mess with. Buddy Landell was another one. I love Buddy. God bless Buddy. I had Buddy against Dawson Idol went all over the building. Scared mm-hmm. the living hell out of everybody. Everybody in that building had a front row seat. I had Kevin Sullivan. I had Terry Funk. I mean, I talk about names today that are, I mean, it's a shame because as Terry Funk just passed away, as the guy... I have, I'm writing this book and I keep having a list of all the wrestlers that work for me that have passed away. And I, I, I keep, the list keeps growing. Mm-hmm. Okay. And it was just, so getting back to that, it was, it was actually Abdullah that got me the Sheik. And it's amazing. I got Bam Bam got me Terry Gordy. The Sheik got me, or uh, Abdullah got me the Sheik. Give me another, give me another match and I'll bet you there's a connection. Well, uh, one of the uh, interesting ones that that stood out to me, being being a fan of, uh, and again we've briefly talked about him uh, being a fan of his work from uh, World Class and uh, the NWA and his uh, atrocious uh, booking in WWF, in my opinion, uh, really ingenious match of Al Perez versus Stan Lane with Jim Cornette. Yeah, that, that was, and that was an opening match. I was, mm. I think that was the opening match. It was the opening match. Yeah, yeah. Al Perez was another one that didn't cost me a lot. His transportation, but the ladies loved him. Okay. And Stan Lane was another one who was put together. And it was funny because Jim Cornette, I mean, I can go back on my shows. I, I loved the managers. Paulie Dangerously was a manager for me. Jim Cornette was a manager for me. And I just, Jim was somebody I spoke to all the time. And unfortunately, I never got Bobby Eaton on a show. Okay. I was glad to get Stan Lane. And I had him with, with Jim Cornette against it. And that was a match I put together. I mean, it was in a, there was, and think of, there was no storyline there. And some of the, in history, in looking back to my shows, I really had way too many matches that didn't have a storyline. It was just, in that case, getting two names, put them together. Voila, I had tag team matches where I had the battle of the sex gods, you know, and I had Austin Idol and Al Perez as a tag team. Uh, Why? There was no story. There was no reason. Okay. But but to me, it just worked. Now, Mm -hmm. that match didn't work as much as it could have. Okay. But why have, you know, as a promoter, why have a tag match where you have four guys on there? Why not have two single matches? Okay. Mm -hmm. Unless you have a Road Warriors or something like that. Um, so anyway, that match was mine. Um, but that was just one me calling Jim Cornette. I was able to get Jim and Stan, Stan anytime. Like I said, I never got Bobby Eaton. And my understanding was Bobby didn't like to travel. Okay. And he lived, he lived in Hudsville, Alabama, was a family man. And obviously he's since passed away, but I never got, I never got him. I met him. I knew him, but I never got to get him up on the show. But they, yeah, Stan Perez, Al Perez, Al Perez and Stan Lane. That was my call. Yeah, I, I thought that was interesting because Perez uh, was uh, coming off that that mostly heel work, but he also worked well as a as a face. Yep. He, I'll tell you, if you're good, you can do both. Okay. I remember Don Morocco telling me, because I had Don Morocco against Bobby Orton on, on Bob Orton on one of my shows. One of the things that he told me was he used to love to work different, go six weeks in the territory and leave. OK, and he would go and not an opening match, but he would start out and he would build and build, eventually go for the strap. And then he would have a lose, leave the town match. And he. Oh, sorry about that. The one thing that he told me was you don't get stale. 
So your baby face over here and six weeks later, you become a heel. And, and that's exactly what he did. Okay. And what a lot of people forget, don't know, or maybe don't realize when he was working the program with Jim, Snook, Jimmy Snooker. Okay. And they did the match in the Madison square garden. that Everybody remembers where Snooker jumps off the top of the cage. What people don't realize is that's after the match. The match was over when Snooker did that jump. And yeah. so what you realize is it's not the match that people remember. Okay. So here Morocco takes that. Trust me when I tell you that one hurt Morocco a lot. Okay. Cause you can't jump that far. Uh, and Snooker was great at it, but he took it and it was after the match. And Morocco just said he's, he'll never be stale because of that. Mm -hmm. Yep, very, very true. Uh, another one that uh, that jumped out, given the time frame, and I think it was one of, unfortunately, uh, the last matches of uh, Kerry Von Erich when you had him against Lawler. Yeah, well, again, they had done that match a hundred times. Um, in fact, the story with the match I had is the night before they wrestled at the Sportatorium. Okay, and one one of the reputations that Curry had, may rest in peace, was he was a no-show. Except in Texas, he was a no-show. Well, I had a reputation that people, I don't have that many no-shows. Okay, so I actually said to Lawler, and again, I was close with Lawler. I said to Lawler, can you do me a favor? Can you make sure Curry gets on the plane? Okay, and I'll take care of you. Well, God bless Jerry Lawler. He, it's amazing what he'll do for a little extra money. Well, sure enough, that that morning he made sure that Curry Von Eric was on the plane. My ex brother in law, and I divorced twice, but my ex my ex brother in law picked Curry up at the airport. Okay, because again I was KK, being K, they had to be in different. Anyway, he gets in Scott's car. And the first thing Curry Von Erich says to him is, I want a Pat Steak. Philly's known for its cheesesteaks. Mm -hmm. So Pat Steaks is the tourist trap. So they go to the Pat Steaks, they get a steak sandwich. And my understanding was he got two of them. Okay, and then Scott drives him to Temple University. Now, when he gets to Temple University, he goes into the dressing area, he gets dressed. He comes out and he actually says to my ring announcer, what city am I in? Okay. Okay. And of course he told them. And at some point in the match, he says, hello, Philadelphia or whatever the case was. He was out of it. He flew from Dallas, Texas the night before he was in Sportatorium, had Jerry Lawler in the plane with him, gets off the plane. My bono takes him through Philadelphia to Pat Stakes, gets to Temple University and doesn't know what city he's in. Mm. Okay. And I spent a little bit of time with Curry in the back, but he was out of it. He, I don't know if he was wasted, but he was pretty damn close. Okay. Mm. But then I, I wanted to match. And one of the things that Jerry Lawler said to me, he says, you want to do something a little different? I said, sure. He says, you mind if I throw fire? I said, no, I don't think anybody's ever thrown fire in Philadelphia. That's exactly what they did. Okay. The problem was that nobody was expecting it. Half the crowd didn't even see it because their head was turned or whatever. So we he threw he threw fire, and that's how I got fire in Philadelphia. It wasn't my head; it was Cherry's. <laughs> Tremendous, <laughs> and and perhaps the um, the series of matches that uh, TWA is is remembered uh, very very much for, and that's the 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 program between Hot Stuff Eddie Gilbert and Cactus Jack. Yep. And boy, oh boy, I to this day, I am so sorry that Eddie passed away. Okay, because there's so much more that we could have done. We did everything possible. And the one thing with Cactus and Eddie, as I do believe, I never had to say to the guys one thing. I never said to the guys, go around the building. I never said to the guys, come up. They came up with the program. Okay, and I said to them both. I said, you make this program, you'll be on every show, especially my big shows. Now, I had my big shows, Autumn Armageddon, Spring Spectacular, Winter Challenge, Summer Sizzler. I'll put them on every show. The local shows, Cactus is going to be on, Eddie's going to be traveling, et cetera, et cetera. I'll put you on, I swear to God, give me a, and that's what they did. They built up where I got them onto every, everything. So we finally had, I had a three-way phone call 
with Cactus and with Eddie. And I said, I have an idea. Now, I'm not sure what, and this is when we got into the three, that summer match where we had the, uh, the Falls County were in the building match. Then they had the stretcher match and then they had the steel cage match. Well, I didn't, I didn't come up with those three. I came up with the idea of having three matches, two out of three falls during the course of the show. That was my worst attended show. It was Summer Sizzler. It was hot as hell in Philadelphia. And I only had 800 and some odd people. Okay. And that today we're talking about that match. And mm. by the time the match was over, there was only three or 400 people left. A lot of the crowd was exhausted from all the violence on that show. I mean, mm. I, I swear to God, people were tired of the violence. Mm -hmm. Okay. But that was a car. We could have gone. I could have had lumberjack matches. You know, I had a lumberjack match with um, a Terry Funk and Jerry Lawler. And it was a legitimate lumberjack with people who wanted to be lumberjacks in the crowd would write tickets. Okay. Uh, write their names out. And we had a legitimate, I think it was 12, three people for each side of the ring. We picked 12 fans who had to sign waivers and they legitimately were part of the lumberjacks. Bob McGee was one of those guys, and he does the newsletter. And some of the guys almost got – Terry Funk wanted to beat the hell out of those people. I was going to say it sounds like an insurance nightmare coming from oh, a promoter's I perspective. I had issues for that thing beyond belief. The waiver was ridiculous. And yeah. even, even my insurance guy basically said, if somebody wants to see you, they will. And if you see the video, because it's on YouTube, I'm telling you, when Terry Funk would go out of the ring and four guys would push him, he wanted a beat. He swung at people. And I tell you, I had one comment. Bulldog Brower was one of my managers. And if you're an old-timer, you knew Bulldog. Because he, he had nine sellouts at Madison Square Garden against, against Bruno San Martino. And B Bulldog Brower used to tell me in the back, you're nuts, <laughs> meaning me. You're getting your, you're going to, you're going to get yourself in trouble. Now, fortunately, it didn't happen. Okay, but oh, I man, we came close. We came close. The kicker was that the people that were the lumberjacks, they wanted to get hurt. <laughs> okay, that was the problem. They wanted to. They wanted to tell everybody that Terry Funk beat the hell out of him. I mean, it was just, it was crazy. I sorry for going off on tangents, but no, the, no, no. This is great. Yeah, the this Eddie, is great. I, I just heard Terry Funk and uh, fan lumberjacks, and well, it's and it's amazing. Like I said, it's on YouTube. And it's amazing. I see stuff on YouTube I didn't expect. And it was funny. You, you know, you mentioned me with the magazines. One of the contacts that I had was Rob Feinstein. And everybody knows Rob because Rob's done, doing all the stuff he's doing. I threw him out of a building one time. Okay? Because I he broke my walls. Okay? and But Rob, Rob lives 30 minutes from me. Okay? And, I mean, if I was still, if I was still promoting... I'd be doing stuff with Rob. I mean, between his Ring of Honor and between all the Battleground and between all the other stuff that he does now. And now he's starting a wrestling school. I, you know, I had a wrestling school, Ringmaster's Wrestling School. I, the, all this stuff, all the Rob Fein, the fact that you can watch Rob Feinstein on his YouTube or Facebook, the fact that you can read the magazines and know where they, they came from and where a lot of these pictures came from, we were all part of it. We, I couldn't have made it without all of them. I succeeded because of them. I failed because of me. I didn't mm. fail because of them. And I succeeded. There, it was all part of it. It was all from the day I met Carmel and Paul to the day Carmel and basically they retired and go, went off on their own. And to, for me, I could tell you stories about the radio show. I could take it. I could. I don't know how long this show is. I could take two hours and talk about the radio show and mm -hmm. story after story after story. Dusty Rhodes. I mean, the connection to Dusty that I had to Dusty, the radio show, I swear to you, was because of Dusty Rhodes. Okay. And what happened when I went on to WIP radio, which is the main radio sports station in Philadelphia, Carmel and I got, were pushed off the radio because the radio station that we were on decided to close. So we didn't know what to do. And long story, well, long story long, I knew somebody from years and years and years ago in high school who happened to be doing the news on that radio station. I happened to call the radio station, and I got this fellow by the name of Tom Brookshire. And if you're not in Philadelphia, you wouldn't know who that is. 
But anyway, he was on the plane two days before with Dusty Rhodes. And he said he is a wrestling fan. And sure enough, wrestling radio became a hard pass show in Philadelphia. So, I, again, going off on tangents, these stories are just amazing uh, of how one thing leads to another, leads to the other, leads to the other, leads to the other. Anyway. Yeah, def- definitely a, a very, very small, small world. You, you uh, launched or TWA launched the careers of, of many Eastern Championship Wrestling and then ECW guys. And, and you went through the list before, but just out of respect, I'll, I'll, I'll yeah. mention them. Hitman Tony Stetson, Johnny Hotbody, DC Drake, okay, wait, wait. Larry Winters. Wait, wait, before you start, those four, those four were around before me. Okay, to- Gi- Johnny Hotbody was more the newcomer for me. He came out of Monster Factory, but putting them together, Tony Stetson and Johnny Hotbody both lived in South mm. Philadelphia, and the whole city knew that these two guys hated each other. They didn't. OK, but that was so real. What they watched the matches when, I, you know, Philadelphia's known as the city of brotherly love. Well, I had them wrestle in the city of brotherly hate match. OK, and they beat the living shit out of, excuse my English, out of each other. The whole city knew that these two guys hated each other. And they did. They wore it on their sleeve. They wore it in South Philadelphia. And to this day. Um, Bay Ragney, who has another podcast, had Tony Stetson on one time, had Johnny Hotbody on one time, and they respect each other. Larry Winters and DC Drake had their names gone hot before I ever came into the picture. I took it to the next level, um, and I still talk to DC Drake. In fact, I just saw him roll uh, this year up in Rhode Island. And those guys were there before me. Now, there's other guys. Um, Sandman, you talk about ECW. Just, just Sandman. Sandman came out of our school, came from mm-hmm. Ringmasters Wrestling School. Glenn mm-hmm. Osborne, okay, came from our school. Bay Ragney, Chubby Dudley came from my school. Jimmy Gennetti came from Ringmasters Wrestling School. I mean, I can go down the. Those are the guy. J T Smith. Mm-hmm. J T Smith against John, uh, against the Sandman was a main event match anywhere in Philadelphia once they got rolling. But they both worked in my school. Okay, now keep in mind, it was my school. I didn't do anything in the ring. It was Larry Winters and Ron Shaw who were the the teachers, if you will. When J.T. Smith and and Sandman did their match at the school, I swear to you, I enjoyed those matches, even though they were training. They were beating the living hell out of each other, and they were stiff. Okay, those I take more credit with Sandman and J.T. Smith and Glenn Osborne and Jimmy Gennetti and, and Bay Ragney and those guys than I do with Larry Winters, D.C. Drake, Johnny Hotbite. Yes, I took them to the next level. Mm-hmm. OK, no question about it. And I think if you really want to look back, you take the five of us. So you take D.C. Drake, Larry Winters, Johnny Hotbite, Tony Stetson and Joel Goodhart. And we are the reason Philadelphia is a hotbed. I don't care what anybody says. Nobody will ever tell me that I'm wrong. Yeah, and we'll we'll get into that uh, in 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 a bit. But it, it's it's interesting to me from from a promoting and booking perspective. I saw that you had this great base of 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 talent um, that 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 kind of anchored and cemented everything, and then. You 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 had the uh, the big name imports, and it really was a a winning uh, formula for it. For it was. While. I mean, I go back. Look, I I didn't even mention Rock and Rebel, and a lot of people don't want to mention his name. But even I could take my local guys, come up with three or four matches, whether they were tag matches, individual matches, five matches, and I could give. They would be the stars of the show. Unfortunately, they don't sell tickets when they first start. Now, one thing Rock and Rebel did for me, he sold me tickets. He sold 25 tickets to every show. Okay. Tony Stetson, Johnny Hotby started selling tickets for me in South Philly. Uh, um, it, it's just amazing to me how much the local talent made the show, but it, it, it didn't. So it's the combination of the two. 
And then what I started to do, if you ever look at my shows, my semi-main event was a local show, was local talent. So I never got them to be the main event, but they were always first, second, and then they were third, then were before or after intermission, and then close to the end. Then every time I could get grow local talent, that was one less person I had to bring in. Mm, okay. Mm. And one of the deals that I made with every guy that went to Ringmasters Wrestling School is you go through Ringmasters and pay the tuition, and I'll guarantee that you make the money back wrestling. That's how I did it. Now, unfortunately, for some of the guys, I got out of the business before I could pay. Bay Ragney never got a nickel. Okay. So there are people, but and the other, I could put, and you mentioned some names. You give me J.T. Smith against a Sandman, main event. You give me Larry Winners against D.C. Drake, main event. Johnny Hot, Body Stoney, Tony Stetson, main event. I bring those matches up, and the reason, Buddy Landell, main, I mean, he was on every show. I used to have six main events. Mm. One or two was the names, but I had six main events. When I had Larry Winners, D.C. Drake, and I did them at Temple University where they felt they threw they threw them off the uh, the second floor. ECW watched all these films where they jump it off the we did that before ECW ever did it. Now they took it to another level. I'll give them credit for that. Okay. Todd Gordon, you know, I got to meet Todd Gordon through Variety Club. Todd Gordon used to sit ringside. Then he became an advertiser. Then I eventually had him do some ring announcing. And fortunately. Look, when I went under, he picked it up. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. And the good news, bad news is he made a, he did great with it. He lost his shirt. Okay. I lost my shirt. Okay. But think about this one. Bob Ortiz, who was his ring announcer, used to sit ringside at my shows. If you go look at it, he, he became an investor toward the end. Okay. But he and Lex used to sit ringside at every one of my shows. So, mm -hmm. I mean, ECW would not have been. <laughs> it would not mm. have been without us, no question. Mm. Wanted to to ask you about this this really famous uh, show that uh, I, I read about in the magazines and was you know auto automatically really interested uh, that that unfortunately never happened. You know, I'm talking about uh, Nature Boy Buddy Rogers versus Landell, but also I, I read that you had Williams and Gordy against Furness and Lafon on for that show as well what what uh what was the how did those particular matches come together i think the the cancellation is kind of secondary to my sure. uh, well, line of questioning here if the if that show would have happened i would to this day still be broke i was spending money like a banshee the guys i had to fly in from germany i had been while on that thing i had flying in from germany it was seven, like if I remember correctly, $1,750 to fly him in. It was more to fly him in than actually put him on the show. I had Gordy. I had Williams. They were coming from all different parts of the country. I was literally, I was going broke to the point where it, I went broke. Now, what happened was, a little story when you talk about the Battle of the Nature Boys, Buddy Rogers, again, Carmella knew Buddy Rogers. They were very close. It was easy for me to get in there. And Buddy Rogers came and did some of my shows. After Carmella got out of the business per se, he did some shows for me. He was a guest referee. Okay, so I had a match in, in, New, in New Jersey. It was Bam Bam Bigelow against Dr. Death Steve Williams, and Buddy Rogers was the guest referee. Why? Okay, that was, I mean, no reason, other than Buddy Rogers was from Jersey. Well, one time I was talking to Buddy in the back, and it was just a, a whim. And I and I, I will take a step back. I was trying to get Ric Flair at one of my shows. Yeah, I was going to ask you that too. Yeah, okay. and I, I we agreed on a number. It wasn't the money, but by the time I was getting ready to put everything together, he signed up with WCW or WW whatever it was, and I wasn't going to get him. So I had talked to Nature Boy. I I got and here I was actually in my mind was going to Buddy Rogers against Ric Flair. I, I, I'm sorry, Buddy Landell against Ric Flair. I never even thought about Buddy Rogers. So one day I'm talking to him because the, the, the Ric Flair wasn't going to happen. And I said to him, I got a question for you. Any chance I can get you to do a battle of the Nature Boys with Landell? And I swear to God to you, 
both of them were gone. So nobody can witness this. They're looking down. It took him three seconds. And he said, I'll do it. And I was taken back by it. I said, well, wait a second. got to do this in a, in a, in a card. And let's do this. We'll book it for this and this and this. And we'll run a little match here and there. And we'll, we'll write a little story. And Buddy Rogers says to me, if I'm going to wrestle, I want to wrestle in the 90s. Because that way I wrestled in the 90s, 80s, 70s, 60s, and 50s. I want to wrestle in four, five different uh, decades. He then starts to work out. I just wanted him to run a match. I didn't, know, I didn't need him to be a, the wrestler. He starts working out, and my under, he used to spend two to three hours in the gym every day. Mm-hmm. Now, Buddy Landell comes up to me, and God bless Buddy. Buddy says to me, I assume you want Buddy Rogers to win this thing. How about if we just do, let's do a match that takes a minute. Let him beat the living shit out of me and surprise everybody. Well, nobody expected that. First of all, I wasn't going to ask Buddy Landell to lay down for Buddy Rogers. I certainly wasn't going to ask Buddy Rogers to lay down for Buddy Landell. I wasn't sure what the finish was going to be. Landell came up with the finish. We're going That's to, a pro. You know, let's jab back and forth for minutes, give everybody some happy, and then let's do one minute and beat the living hell out of me. No comeback. One, two, three. Clean fit. Clean fit. That was Buddy's finish. But that's what happened with my guys. When the people that were working for me, they understood the wrestling business. Okay. Buddy Landell knew he couldn't beat Buddy Rogers. Okay. And so he said to me, let him knock me the hell out. One, two, three. Put Rogers over. Okay. And I, and I said, well, you mean you're going to attack him afterward? No. I'll be dead or dead. I let him de- let him parade around. Everybody's go- That's how I got Owen Hart. Okay, that's how, I mean, these guys all understood the business. I didn't have to give them finishes. I didn't have to give them times. The only thing they always said to me was, how much time do we have? And I never said, I need 19 minutes. I said, I'll tell you what I need. I need a crowd popping match. I don't care if the match takes 50 minutes or 30 minutes. The problem is, if every match takes 50 minutes, we'll be here all day. <laughs> okay, so they understood the bit. And then they understood where I put them on the card. If it was the first match. They can only do certain things. If it's main event, it's main event. Mm-hmm. Were, were you going to have Flair involved in the Landell Rogers deal? Was I wanted. That I wanted. That, I wanted. Well, actually, my original game plan was that Buddy Ride was to have Buddy Landell against Ric Flair. Mm-hmm. Okay, and then Buddy Rogers come out and challenge whoever wins. That's mm-hmm. what that was in my mind. Never happened. That's mm-hmm. what I wanted to have happen because. I didn't perceive myself. I didn't think I was going to get Buddy Rogers to wrestle. Okay. His, his his last match was what, against Flair in 78, 79, and around there? I, you want to know something? I'm not sure. Okay. I've heard a couple different stories. What mm-hmm. I do know is it was a long time before he was going to wrestle again, and then he took it serious. Mm-hmm. God bless him. I, you know, I, took, I thought if I could get Flair and Landell, that would be, a, first of all, it would be a good match, okay? Then whoever, whatever, the, then you have Buddy Rogers come out, okay? Now, Flair, to be honest with you, both of these, they were all professionals. Landell would have won that match, okay? Because Flair wasn't going to be around independent for long, and I think he knew that, okay? If it was Landell against Buddy Rogers, which is what we ultimately came up with, okay, I thought that, they would at least wrestle. And Buddy Landell said, no, let him, let's him. let just jockey with the crowd for 10 minutes. And then when we start to wrestle, let him beat the living hell out of me. One, two, three, I'm out. And I, weird, I, I think about this stuff, and I don't have any other than Ric Flair. I mean, I don't have Buddy Landell around. Okay, I certainly don't have Buddy Rogers around. So nobody can validate the story. That's what they did. And Buddy, Buddy Rogers took that stuff. He started working out to unbelievable, unbelievable. And then Landell, to, I mean, to the day when Landell died, he, he wanted that match so bad. Because even if he lost, he would have come out a win. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and it's, it's even like if you go back to Cactus against uh, Cactus Joke against Eddie Gilbert. One time Cactus would win, then Eddie would win, and Cactus would win. And it, the, the neat thing there is that it was. When we had the finish of the cage match, I had Doug Gilbert come into the cage. Mm-hmm. Nobody even knew who the hell Doug Gilbert was. 
Okay, and I didn't pay Doug for that. Doug did that on his own, but he knew that was going to get in the magazines. And that would jumpstart his career a little bit. And then Bam Bam Bigelow came out. And then I used to love when we used to have the guys all wrestling outside the ring. And one time I got Kevin Sullivan against Terry Funk. And I had Bam Bam Bigelow. And all the main eventers were all outside the ring just supporting roles. I'm going off on tangents and I apologize. But some of this some of this stuff is just incredible. No, this this is important for uh, wrestling history purposes. I guess uh, Rogers must have been really disappointed that the match never oh, happened. I never. Well, let's put it this way: I didn't speak to him after it didn't happen. I mm-hmm. do know he was disappointed, no question about it. And mm-hmm. I, look, I, it's thirty years later. I disappointed a lot of people. To be honest with you, I disappointed myself. Okay, mm-hmm. and in hindsight. I mean, if I if if I had gotten television, if I had really deep pockets, <clears throat> I was going to ask you about your efforts to get TV, and because obviously with such a buzz, such a fabulous pro- uh, product, that was a essential next step. Yeah, there was no look. I had had conversations; nothing ever got serious. Um, and to me, TV. Look, uh, the radio show was my television. Okay. The problem was I was basically a one man operation. Mm. Okay. And I didn't have time. And I I was maintaining my own career and financial services at the same time. The wrestling was really part time. Now I, I left my career for two years figuring, let me see if I can make a go of it, which I did. I just was a one man operation. I didn't have the time if I would have had three partners and one of them could have gotten a TV, maybe I could have gotten television, you know, but the one thing I know is with television, you need the building, you need the talent, you need the, you got to get the advertisers. I couldn't get advertisers for the radio show yeah. because I was, a, I was in an advertising agency, you know? So, I mean, I, I look, Todd Gordon was one of my advertisers and look, being an advertiser, look where that created. Okay. Mm-hmm. And you know, Todd is God, right? So he thinks, mm-hmm. <laughs> okay, okay. So, I mean, the bottom line is you look at this, the history here of everything, there's a, a reason for everything, okay? And the fact that Bob Orr and Lex Ortiz can sit at ringside at my show and one thing led to the other and then we eventually used his ice skating rink to do shows. Then he winds up being the ring announcer on TV for ECW. This all started from, from being sitting ringside at my, that, and there's a lot of, Angel, Angel Amoroso, was one that used to come and see my shows, and now you know she does her thing, and I had I can go down the list. It's scary, it's scary. It, it, the ripple effect is amazing. Which which kind of leads to my <clears throat> my next question, and that's that a, a lot of historians have have indicated that um, you know TWA doesn't get uh, the credit that it deserves for uh, spawning uh, Eastern Championship Wrestling, and then ultimately. ECW, Extreme Championship Wrestling, and then even the Attitude Era. Sure. So uh, that that Philly style seemed to really come together uh, under TWA, and without that, that was kind of the seed that 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 grew the the tree, so to speak. Do, do you do you think that that is a that is an accurate uh, statement that TWA really seems to? not not be in the, the conversation in that broader perspective. Well, it's interesting. Yeah, I tend, I will agree with that statement. I will tell you that for those who are in the business, TWA gets mentioned all the time. All right. For those who are the Johnny come lately, yeah, ECW, they think they created in Philly. Now, keep in mind what TWA did. I took the best of Jerry Lawler in Memphis. I took the best of world class. So I didn't create anything. What I did is I blended it all together. Okay. And I I always like to tell people, if you look at the history, the history that we created, I can sit back today and watch Stone Cold Steve Austin. Okay. Although he's not wrestling anymore. Okay. But I could take that Stone Cold. Well, who, who, where'd Stone Cold come from? Well, I got news for you. He's a copy of the Sandman. Mm Mm-hmm. Okay, and where did Sandman come from? Now, I didn't create the Sandman persona. I had Sandman as a beach bum. Mm-hmm. Okay, because that's the way Larry Winters perceived him. But 
Sandman came from Ringmasters Wrestling School. Okay, and you can go down. The, so yes, I I know where the credit is deserved. Okay, I know that yes, Todd Gordon took it to another level, no question. But the reason Todd Gordon was even started was because he I got to meet him through the radio show. Okay, and he became an advertiser, and one thing, and we struck up a friendship. And then he was, as it turned out, because he was on the board of directors of Variety Club, the first three or four shows we did at Temple University, we worked with Variety Club because they provided the insurance. I gave them a donation. They provided the insurance, and it worked. And one thing led to the other, and Todd Gordon went and created the ECW. Paul mm-hmm. Lee Dangerously worked on my first show at Temple University. Okay? Mm-hmm. And I had a match of Bruno San Martino's kid, David, against Larry Zabisco. For the AWA title, right? Well, no, no. It wasn't for a title. Okay. But David in his corner was Bruno. And for La- and Larry Zabisco in his corner was Paulie Dangerously. Mm-hmm. And I tried my – I'm sorry. With, I, we had Larry Zabisco. I tried to get Larry Zabisco to attack or do something with Bruno. Mm-hmm. And – couldn't it just didn't work bruno didn't want it to happen and for a couple of reasons and the match never really took off the way i wanted it to take off okay Mm -hmm. but i want to give bruno a little bit of credit unfortunately he's no longer alive bruno in my first show at temple university okay now keep in mind all the matches that i had there the guys were working on a promise i mean i guaranteed that they were they didn't know if my checks were good etc etc Bruno San Martino had a flight to go back to Pittsburgh an hour after the matches. And we were about the, the matches were about a half hour, 40 minutes from the, the airport. And back in those days, you could walk right up to the airplane. Okay. Bruno in the dressing room, as loud as can be said, says in front of all the boys, Hey, Joel, do me a favor. Just mail me my check. I got to get out of here. When he said that, what he heard, all the guys heard was my check is good. Bruno left without getting paid, okay? And I was established. When Bruno said that, I never had it. Nobody ever said to me, you know, how do, you, how do I know you're good? Bruno said that, and the word got out. So a little bit, I, again, going off on these tangents, I love these tangents because the reality of, the, of what we did in the TWA is you are correct. ECW, Eastern Championship would have never happened. In fact, the only reason he had the Eastern Championship was Todd was smart enough to call a couple of the guys together, Larry Winters and a couple of the guys, and said, let's let's pick up where he left off. And again, mm-hmm. they took it to a much higher level than I would have ever taken it or at that point. Mm-hmm. All right. So if you go back, the ring announcers for ECW was on my ring, was on, on my, you know, front first class, first seats. Todd Gordon came to the show, it was an advertiser, wrestling radio had a lot to do with everything because that was our television. But we, we, if I was able to sell 3000 tickets to an independent card using radio, Mm -hmm. using radio, what do you think I could have done if I had TV? I don't even want to think about it, but so be. Joel, I, I appreciate how generous you've been with your time. I, I want to, before we wrap up, though, get uh, get your summation in terms of looking back on on this experience in your your career in uh, TWA and and the the imprint that it, that it has left. What is your perhaps? I know, and this is hard to to boil down, but what would you say your most uh, the accomplishment that, that, that you have that you're most proud of, what would that be? I'll, you know, it's interesting you said because I'm, I'm going to give a multiple choice answer, okay? I have not spoken to Cactus Jack, Mick Foley, since I got out of the business in 1992, okay? Uh, there are times when he's in the area, I'm going to try to sneak in, and again, I... I assume he'll remember who I am. I'm in his book, 13 pages by name. Okay. I'm convinced that Cactus Jack made multi-million dollars in this business because not because I found him because I didn't find him. 
But he took what we did, what he did with Eddie Gilbert, and took it and made millions of dollars from it. Okay? So I, I, it's weird. And I don't know if he would agree with that. Okay? But I do believe that Cactus Jack made his name somewhat because of TWA. Okay? No question. There's no question in my mind that Eddie Gilbert, Whatever success. Now, again, he was way more. He was successful way before me. I took it to another level. Now, Jerry Lawler didn't need me. Jerry Lawler was obviously in a world into himself. OK, but I'm telling you, I do believe I gave him credibility. OK, for the New York magazines. Austin Idol. God bless him. He still looks phenomenal. You look to send the picture. He still looks like he's the same age. Mm-hmm. Austin Idol was successful way before me. Okay. But you want to know something? He remembers TWA. Sandman became a persona that everybody recognizes the cane or whatever. He started at Ringmasters Wrestling School. Okay. When I talk to Glenn Osborne, the one thing Glenn Osborne tells me is he was able to go through college because of what he made with the TWA. I can go, I can go, D.C. Drake just got um, put into the, uh, the Hall of Fame up in the road, up in New England. Okay, when I happened to go, I drove up there six hours to see him get accepted. And he gave me some acknowledgement from the stage. D.C. Drake, Larry Winters, Johnny Hotbody, Tony Stetson, and Joel Goodhart took it to the next level. And I happen to know Bay Ragney, who I think you've had on your show. He's now promoting that the five of us be put on a banner at the ECW arena. Okay. That ECW arena, you know where that came from? Johnny Hotbody. All right. Johnny. So Johnny Hotbody. And again, Johnny Hotbody was there before me. Johnny Hotbody got ECW arena, which became now a focal point. So Mm -hmm. my answer to your question is I could take an hour and talk about the successes that we had. And the TWA, whether we're by name or not, guess what? You know something? Jack Kilby knows that TWA had something to do with this stuff. And that's all that matters. When the people who are in the know know, I said, I don't, I don't need my name. I, I'm not into that. What I do know is there's a lot of people who follow the sport, who understand what we did. And there's 99% of the wrestling fans that never heard of us and never will. Okay, but that's okay because the one percent do. Well, yeah, and just on a personal level, I I was when I got older, I was fortunate enough to to go down uh, to Philly, Swanson and Rittner attend those original shows, and there I, I can say without question, there's there's no way that would have happened if I hadn't uh, come across TWA in in the magazines and was just the product stood out in magazine form from anything else that that was uh contemporaneous for it so uh yeah I'll, without a doubt i'll tell you how many wrestling promotions had luna vachon baby doll woman missy hyatt i mean i come on paulie dangerously jim Cornette. i can go on and on and on mm-hmm. okay and we we were able to put it all together because quite frankly that's what we did. We took a little from here, took a little from there. We, you know, and we were able to put together a show. And many people, the wrestling fans, the hardcore fans, knew where who we were. They were flying in. They were driving in. We used to do bus trips. Mm-hmm. I'll never forget one quick thing. We did a bus trip off the radio show in the Squared Circle Fan Club. We went up to Troy, New York, which is about a five and a half hour ride from Philly, and we went to see the match with Terry Funk and Ric Flair in an I Quit match. Mm-hmm. And I had gotten 50 tickets to the show ringside, and we did that whole thing. I'm telling you, I saw matches, you know, not that TWA put on, but I had TWA fans that wanted to go see Ric Flair, Terry Funk, and I couldn't do it in Philly. So we went to Troy, New York. Mm-hmm. And it's what we did. And that's how we built what I think is historically something that can never be reproduced again. Yeah, and I would most definitely concur. Joel, can can the fans find you on social media? And can you talk about what uh, you're up to now, including 
I understand uh, you're working on a book. Okay. So let me talk. Social media, I'm not there yet. <laughs> okay. I am on Facebook, but I never go on. Okay. Um, you will find me shortly. What's happening now, we're writing a book. I have two ghostwriters. Okay. And I don't have permission yet to tell you who they are, but let's just say you will know that. Well, yeah, Scott Teal is one of them. You'll know cool. them. And Dan, and Dan Murphy's the other one. You guys will know who they, they are. Yeah. The book is 90% done. Unfortunately, I've said that for five years. Okay. Um, at some point, I'm going to call Scott and I'm going to go down to his place down in Tennessee and I'm going to stay in a hotel for a week and we're going to finish the damn book. Okay. It's not, it's not been Scott. It's not been Dan. It's been me. Okay. Part of it is I'm convinced nobody wants to read my story. What's mm. happening now is I'm getting more and more of these podcasts and whatever. And, and the work, yeah, the book will last for 10 minutes, but I'm going to get the book done. The book goes over my 10 greatest matches. The problem is I swear to God that changes every month. Mm. Okay. It's, it, it's going to have stories of the referees. You know, Jim Molyneux came for me. John Finnegan started before me, but I think I took him to another level. Joe Zanoli was a photographer ringside. Came to a wrestling school, and now he's ECWA, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm going to have, to have stories about the referees. I'm going to have stories in there about the, the ringsiders. I call them the ringsiders. People, the Bob Ortiz's of the world, who the big hat guy, they all were ringsiders at the show and went on to do their own thing in wrestling, good, better, and different. Um, so the book is going to be called, If I, We Wrestled, We Ball, We Tried It All. Okay? And that was a slogan. We used to have... Carmella, if Carmella was on here, she'll tell you, we came up with a, a T-shirt, okay? And it was a T-shirt that we sold to some of our first matches. And again, never, and it's, I'm out of the closet, no longer meek. I'm finally admitting I'm a wrestling freak, okay? So we, that was our, so we, we might start reproducing. I'm going to have to call Carmella and get permission, but we're going to start doing the shirts again, Um the, 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 um, the, so getting back to your, your, there's just so much stuff that we did. So we're, I'm writing this book now to answer part of the other, the other part of the question. Um, I am not on social media for a reason. Okay. I think if I was on social media, to be honest, half the people would get on there and love the product, talk about the matches, et cetera, et cetera. And the other half of the people would yell at me because I went out of business. And when I and when I went out and this, keep in mind it was 30 years ago when I went out of business I had a bond that I had on file with the state of Pennsylvania a ten thousand dollar bond and if you if you had tickets you can get some of the money back the problem is that very few I don't think anybody got all their money back okay but fortunately everybody should have gotten some I now find some people still tell me they never got money back okay and now so I, I say to myself you know what why open myself up to that. I'm now, I'll be, I'm, I'll be 71 years old. My business that I'm in, my financial services business, I've been doing it for 48, April 1st will be 48 years. Um, I'm successful at that. So part of it is I don't want to take time away from that to do the wrestling stuff. I don't promote anymore. I did that one. But you want to know something? One of the, Mike Tartaglia, who's Michael Bruno, one of the wrestlers that we got, and he's the one that tagged up with Tony Stetson. They were the hitmen. Mm -hmm. Well, he keeps toying with me about him wanting to do a show, a TWA kind of reunion show, mm -hmm. where none of our guys would wrestle because the JT Smiths and the Glenn Osborne, just, we just want them in the corner, okay, not involved in the match. But for every match in the ring, I want to have something outside, not wrestling, just have some of the wrestlers bring in DC Drake, myself, et cetera, et cetera, get Bob Ortiz, Todd Gord, whoever would want to participate as a TWA reunion show. Okay. Oh, definitely. And you want to know something? If we had that show, I think people would start coming in. They would drive yes. in, fly in. And I know that uh, it, uh, Mike Tartag has been talking. Breaker Morant is one of the local wrestlers who's phenomenal. I wish I had Bra Breaker against Chris Wilde. I'm telling you right now, was my DC Drake and Larry Winters. Mm -hmm. And if I could do it, if I could be involved with Mike and do a TWA show in the main event, be this Breaker Moran against Chris Wilde. I'm telling you, that's worth the price of admission. Mm -hmm. I swear to God to you, those guys are great. Okay. And here I am 30 some years later and I can recognize good talent. 
And Chris, well, they, they work well together. They're phenomenal. Um, I've heard those guys going on the show. So somewhere along the line, I might have to call you, Jack, get the word out. We'll get some social media going. And what the hell? I will have some fun again. That that would be phenomenal. And I, and I could guarantee we would get a large contingent of old school Canadian uh, fans down for that, just like back in the day. And I think I, I interviewed Tony Stetson about a month ago. We're, we're doing another one, a part two coming up. Cool. I bet he could still go. Oh, the, no, he could go. He doesn't want to. OK, he decided, you know, he's had some mel- some health issues. He could go. Okay. He mentioned if there was a reunion show that he might be able to step back into the ring one more time. Well, you know, it's funny. I would do that in a second if I knew there was a way to make it make so people would not forget his last match. See, the, the kicker now is now we're 30 years after the fact. If I could get DC Drake, Tony, any of these guys that wanted to wrestle, they couldn't do what they did 30 years ago. They just can't. Okay. And you want to know something? I want to, at this sound, I want to remember Tony Stetson the way I remember Tony Stetson. Okay. Mm-hmm. Now, picture this scenario: you have local guys, new guys, but in one corner of the you have Tony Stetson, and the other corner you got Johnny Hotbody. The tease is better than the the end product. We're too old for that. It's the tease. Now you do have to have a little something. You got to get. But let me tell you, there's no. I'm telling you. If, if I was involved in the TWA reunion, it would have to be the way I would want it. Mm. And the way I want to remember these guys is how they used to wrestle. Mm. Okay. But I'm telling you, and again, if I had, I'll just pick, I'm not, to, if you had Johnny Hopbine in one corner, Tony Sess in the other, and in the ring you had Breaker Moran and Chris Wilde, that would be a main event. And I don't know if you know those guys at all up in Canada. Yes. Yes. Those that would be the sh- that would be my main event. Money. Oh my God! Call you call that's money. Okay. Mm-hmm. Now the scary part is, I don't know that those guys know it. Now Breaker and Chris know that they're money. There's no question. Johnny Hotbody. I mean, I spoke to Johnny uh, six months ago, and I hadn't talked to Johnny in 30 years. And I found him before Beg found him. And I was talking to him, and I swear Johnny Hotbody admitted to me that he did not understand that I thought after 30 years he was still one of my main inventors. He didn't see it. He didn't see it. And now that Bay Ragney is doing this promotion to try to get our five names up on the – I'm telling you, if I could – now, Larry unfortunately passed away. If I could get D.C. Drake to come down and be in the corner, I don't need him to be physical at all, just be in the corner, and I could have Johnny Hotbody in the corner and Tony Stetson in the corner – and Glenn Osborne in the corner, Larry Winner's son, who doesn't wrestle, but I would get Larry because Larry, without Larry, I wouldn't have been anybody. He was my booker. Mm-hmm. I would want his family there. We could have a reunion party that would be beyond belief. Okay. And then if I could get JT Smith, the last time I spoke to him, he was in Virginia. If I can get JT to come up, if I can get Sandman to come out to come out and help us, oh my God, we could have you're coming down from Canada. Absolutely. Well, that that is very exciting. We're going to also be interviewing uh, Johnny Hotbody in in the weeks to come, so we could uh, keep this train going. I think it's I think it's long overdue, and the the possibility is is definitely exciting. We'll keep in touch, not only for that, but to get progress on your book. And I'd uh, love to have you back again to uh, get the word out there about that. Anytime you want me, you call me and we'll get it arranged. Really appreciate it, Joel. It certainly uh, was, was uh, something that uh, I, I was looking forward to, uh, being a, a fan of TWA, and uh, I really appreciate your, your, your thoughtful uh, responses and all the experiences that you shared. Jack, I appreciate it. And just remember one thing. We wrestled, we brawled, we tried it all. Thanks, Jack. That's fabulous. Well, fans, that's it for a special edition of the Cheap Heat productions pro wrestling podcast if you haven't please like and subscribe to the channel and you won't miss any of the great content that we have upcoming for you in in this year and we will of course keep you updated in terms of any developments along the twa lines until next time thank you very much for watching